This is a first, first class seat. This is a kind of thing. Michel, where should we meet? from uh, Poland, Krakow, and let me introduce myself. I'm Gregory Oblonski from Washington University in St. Louis. And first, first presentation, now we have plenary lecture. Professor Feng Yishu, he went through many, many obstacles. He just came, this bold figure. Uh, the topic is colloidal metal particles for the synthesis of catalytic material. Professor Ferdi Schur from Max Planck Institute for Kohlenthorschen und Heim Hermann. Deutschland. Okay, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here uh, and make it possible actually to move the talk uh, because I had some unforeseen but totally unavoidable obligation on the original day where my talk was scheduled. So I'm, I'm really very grateful uh, that, that you allowed me to be here nevertheless. What, what I want to do today is to talk about the potential of colloidal metal particles to synthesize novel types of catalytic materials. And the, the advances we, we have made over the last, uh, let's say, 10, 20 years in synthesizing well-defined metal particles with a narrow size distribution allows us to create really novel catalytic materials, functional composites, and we'll give you several examples for that uh, in the next 40 or so minutes. If we look at the length scales we're dealing with in catalysis, this is actually why, is, is this microphone on? Yes. Okay. This is quite a wide range we have to cover. We have to go from the reaction engineering aspects, which are on a meter or even 10 meter scale. We have the, the, the catalytic bodies, uh, monoliths, for instance, in, in denox plants or in car exhaust, which are in the range 10 centimeters to a meter. Then we have the pellets we fill in the reactor. We break up the pellets, which we fill in the reactor. Then we reach the colloidal domain. The colloidal domain is defined it's the size range between a nanometer and uh, a micrometer. And this is the domain we are talking about. And in this domain, we can very carefully control, synthesize metal particles and use them for the creation of functional catalytic materials. Of course, catalyst people are nanoscientists for at least 100 years because the first supported catalysts were nanostructured materials. The, the me noble metal particles on alumina supports had sizes of 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 nanometers. So that was nanotechnology in, in 100 years ago. The advances we have today is that we can do this in a much more controlled way. And we can separate, separate the step of the synthesis of the colloidal metal particles and the synthesis of the catalyst. Because the original pathway to create supported catalysts using nano, with nanoparticles on them is the impregnation and then you basically had to take what you get and play around with parameters. Now you can pre-synthesize the colloidal particles. Now this is the size range we will be focusing at mostly and actually most of the materials I'm going to talk about are in the range between 1 and 10 nanometers because this is the range where we have most surface atoms. This is the interesting range for catalysis. Now first, on one slide, uh, just a very general survey of the, let's say, three fundamental methods to make colloidal, pretty much monodispersed metal nanoparticles. 
A relatively simple and old methodology is the reduction of metal salts in the presence of stabilizers. The thing is, if you want to have monodispersed colloidal particles, you have to use stabilizers to protect the surface and to prevent further growth at a certain point. If you just reduce the metal particles, they will continue to grow and eventually will get pretty big particles which are not completely useless in catalysis but not really exciting for catalytic purposes. So you have to add stabilizers. So you typically take aqueous alcoholic precursor solutions of some metal salt, or you take acetyl acetonates or something like that. You can use many, many different reducing agents. Citric acid is, for instance, one uh, possibility. Sugars are a possibility. You can bubble hydrogen. You can bubble CO through the solutions. Uh, you can use complex hydrides, whatever. Uh, and then you need stabilizers, which are polymers typically, or oleic acid, for instance, which at some point cap the surface of the growing metal particles and prevent further growth so that you can make pretty much monodispersed particles by these technologies. <coughs> the next technique is just a simple decomposition of precursors. There you use already a zero valent metal salt, ideally a zero valent metal salt, for instance a carbonyl complex of nickel, cobalt, iron, uh, like this cobalt octacarbonyl for instance, you put it in a solvent under inert conditions, you heat up, the metal complex decomposes, and you basically directly get the zero valent metal atoms in the solution. Well, normally they would aggregate and also grow to big particles, which you want to prevent. And therefore, you need, again, stabilizers. You can use block polymers, fatty acids, again, oleic acid, uh, many different uh, possibilities we have. Uh, interesting for catalysis, since the decomposition is a rather quick process, and the growth rates under these conditions are relatively high, these particles tend to be rather defective. So if you analyze them carefully with electron microscopy, you find uh, a high concentration of faults in these materials, uh, which could be very interesting for catalytic applications. The third technique I want to show basically use components of the previous ones, which is the synthesis in inverse micelles. You can stabilize water in oil or oil in water emulsions by using surfactants. And by doing that, we take the example of a water in oil emulsion. You have tiny little water droplets of sizes of maybe 10, 20, 50 nanometers, which are stabilized by a layer of surfactant molecules in an oil phase. And these systems are basically stable. And what you would then do is you would use one of these emulsions and, for instance, put the metal salt into the aqueous phase. So you have little nanoreactors, these droplets of water as nanoreactors. Combine it with an identical microemulsion which contains, for instance, a reducing agent in the aqueous phase. Shake it and then the water droplets coalesce and you get nanoreactors in which a reaction, the reduction proceeds. And since these water droplets remain relatively small, although there is exchange between the droplets going on, you're able to control the size of the particles at relatively low uh, sizes. It is also helped, again, by protecting agents, because additional collisions would lead to further growth if you don't pro uh, protect the colloidal metal particles. I want to show you one example from, from a paper from 2001, where actually there, there is a is a pretty nice array even. These are silver particles made by the inverse micelle synthesis and you see that the monodispersity in this case is actually so high that you can, can create a two-dimensional arrangement of particles with that. Now having said, having introduced these methods for the creation of, of the nanoparticles as one component of the system we want to look at, I want to show four examples how we can use nanoparticles in catalysis. The first one is methanol synthesis. The next one is fundamental questions in gold catalysis. And then I will introduce two nanostructured composite materials, uh, magnetically separable 
catalyst based on nanoparticles and hollow shell encapsulated nanoparticles which will not grow by sintering because they are protected by the shell. These four examples I will discuss and hopefully thus show you how interesting such metal nanoparticles can be in catalysis. So let's first go to methanol synthesis. This is a very well known technical process. Methanol, one of the highest volume chemicals, first, uh, fourth place in, in tons per year produced. It's made from syngas, typically over copper, zinc oxide, alumina catalysts, a relatively simple reaction. And we asked ourselves, can we, do we need all the components of the technical catalyst? Or can we maybe do only with copper nanoparticles? There is some belief in the literature that the zinc oxide is important just to create a high dispersion of the copper. And if that's the case, then we should be able to make very high activity catalysts just by making nano-sized copper particles, which also have a very high dispersion. If we can maintain that in the reaction conditions, we'll make a pretty active catalyst without needing this relatively complex composite. Now, the pathway to make copper nanoparticles was introduced by Helmut Wennemann from our institute uh, over the, uh, I would say, last 10 years. The copper synthesis stabilized by an aluminum compound is reported in this publication. You basically start with acetyl acetonate of the metal salt. You can use copper, but you can also make other uh, complex uh, particles with it. And then you do the reduction of this metal salt by a metal alkyl compound quite air sensitive, so you have to do everything on the protective guard, otherwise it will, it will immediately burn. And the interesting thing is, you can use aluminum, octyl or butyl or any other alkyl as a stabilizer, or you can use <coughs> zinc, which means you can introduce the components of the technical catalyst at will at the formation stage of the copper nanoparticles. And what we then get is essentially a layer, which is an alkyl, acetyl, uh, acetonato, aluminum or zinc layer over the copper nanoparticles. The conditions of the reduction, for instance the chain length of the alcohol, determine to some extent the size and size distribution of the particles. This is what you get with aluminum octal. The particles are on average about 4 nanometer in size, the copper particles. Aluminum butyl, they are somewhat bigger going to 6, 7, 8 nanometers in size. The zinc butyl ones are again uh, in the size as the aluminum butyl stabilized ones. And then we asked ourselves, are these nanoparticles active in the catalytic reaction? This is not a trivial thing to do because normally you have uh, syngas passing in the gas phase over a fixed bed catalyst. Now we have to do it in a slurry under protective atmosphere, otherwise our particles will be oxidized eventually and precipitate as copper oxide. So we had to develop uh, a continuous homogeneous methanol synthesis setup with, with the centerpiece, a high pressure reactor that holds up to 250 bars, uh, into which we can fill the slurry containing the copper nanoparticles. And then there is online analysis, online GC analysis attached to the autoclave, here is the gas supply autoclave, so that everything runs under uh, constant pressure. Uh, typically we ran reactions at 150 centigrades, 200 bars, but we went up to 200 centigrades and appreciably above 200 bars. This is not the typical syngas composition you have in the gas phase because you, you have to take into account the solubility of the gases in THF to come to roughly uh, identical as in the gas phase. If you do the reaction, you indeed see that these copper nanoparticles produce methanol. This is the methanol concentration in the THF after we press CO, hydrogen, carbon dioxide onto the reactor. This is the heat up phase, so this is not an induction period. We, we start measuring uh, after <coughs> pressurizing the system and then we heat it up. And you see it's basically a linear increase. Uh, this experiment was done at 160 centigrades, 200 bars. The maximum productivity we obtained was 25 moles per hour per kilogram copper 
at 170 centigrades. And that corresponds roughly to the activity of the technical catalyst at 240 centigrades. That's about 30 moles methanol per hour and kilogram for the technical catalyst. So these copper nanoparticles are in fact extremely active in methanol synthesis without having zinc, which is considered to be essential for the technical catalyst. These are aluminum stabilized, so there is just copper with some aluminum on the surface. Like in the technical catalyst, the, the primary step of the synthesis is in fact hydrogenation of CO2. The mechanism of the methanol synthesis, there is pretty much agreement nowadays, does not proceed from CO, but the CO2 is the initial carbon source for methanol synthesis. That was actually uh, first discovered here in Russia. And the CO2 is regenerated continuously during the reaction by the water gas shift reaction. This we find also for the copper catalysts. If we run it just with syngas, without CO2, the activity is zero. And as soon as we add CO2 to the syngas, reaction takes off and we get methanol formation. So also here in this case, the CO2 is the primary source for the carbon in the methanol synthesis. We can do that at different temperatures. It works up to about 170 centigrades. These are the rates and we can actually extract activation energies for the reaction from that. There is no line for 180 centigrade because at 180 centigrades the colloids start to get unstable. They oxidize uh, probably by the carbon dioxide precipitate and after just a few hours we have a brown sludge at the bottom uh, of the of the order. But at 170 centigrades you can run the reaction for days without uh, losing activity and without precipitating the proper colloids. Finally, we wanted to compare the system with the heterogeneous system, and we deposited these copper colloids on the mesoporous CMK5 carbon. This is what, what it looks before reaction. So this is really barely visible. These are two, three nanometer copper particles here on the porous support. After reaction, they grow by about a factor of three. The CO hydrogenation rate, or CO2 hydrogenation, I should probably say, is as high as the commercial catalyst if we, if we normalize to copper content, but there must be some different mechanistic pathway because the primary product at the short contact times we had is not methanol, but methylformate, which is basically can be considered as an intermediate on the way if you have the ester formation in between. Uh, if you hydrogenate the methylformate further, you get two methanol molecules out. So this is halfway on the way to methanol, but this is normally not observed for the commercial catalyst. So some mechanistic details seem to be diff different, but this system is basically without zinc oxide as active as the commercial catalyst. So this is just due to the fact that we can create this high copper surface area by the colloidal metal pathway. Now let's come to the next picture, and since this is a Boreshkov conference, I thought I should make one reference to the work of Boreshkov here. Boreshkov was very much interested in the effect of particle size on catalytic reaction rates. That's the question of structure-sensitive reaction and structure-insensitive reaction. And he has very, very carefully studied a structure-insensitive reaction, where the normalized rate is independent of particle size. And this is a very, very careful study, ranging from platinum particle sizes as small as one nanometer to basically bulk platinum. And this group looked at hydrogen oxygen, so hydrogen uh, oxidation reaction over platinum silica. <coughs> and they basically found that the normalized reaction rate, this is a, a rate normalized to surface atoms, is independent of particle size or an extremely wide range. So for this reaction, it was really settled. There is no question about it. But there is another reaction of extremely high current interest in the literature, but this is clearly not the case, and that is the CO oxidation of the gold catalyst, where it's pretty clear that <coughs> you need small gold particles, preferably in the range of 5 nanometers, to get catalytic activity in CO oxidation, and I would say unprecedentedly high catalytic activity. That was discovered by Haruta in the middle of the 80s, 
when he really found if you, if you make low particles small, <coughs> support them on the correct support material in the right way, they oxidize CO at very high rates, even at room temperature and below. Particle size of the gold needs to be preferably 5 nanometers or below. But I think one would have to say that despite 20 years of research, this was the middle of the 80s, now we are the middle of the 2000s. It is not clear what the influence of the support is, whether there is an influence of the support. <clears throat> it is not clear where and how the reaction occurs. And I would argue that, that in many cases, not even the catalyst synthesis is reproducible. And that's, in my opinion, the reason for all the conflicting results in literature. The catalysts are just not the same. Now, there are a number of ideas around um, claiming that there are active and passive supports and that it's important to have an active support to create a good catalyst. And an active support is a redox active one, one which can activate the oxygen. There are, there are some mechanistic ideas <coughs> how the reaction may proceed. It's all highlighted in this, this paper here. Uh, one is that everything happens on the gold and that these small particles has a, have a special uh, um, ability to dissociate the oxygen, which bulk gold normally does not do, and therefore activate the reactants for this reaction. Uh, the other idea is that oxygen absorption is at the support or at the inter interface on such reducible oxides. And then the reaction occurs at the perimeter. And the third idea is a mass equivalent type mechanism where you also need a reactor, the redox reactor support, where somewhere on the support the oxygen is split, it moves through the support, and eventually spills over to the gold where it's used for oxidizing the CO to CO2. So these are ideas are around, and the nature of the support is a critical point there. So people have tried to elucidate what the support really does, but the problem is if you deposit by full precipitation or in simply wetness impregnation or whatever process, gold particles on different supports, you cannot simultaneously control the gold particle size because you basically have to take what you get and play around with these parameters, but you are never sure that you're looking at identically sized gold particles. And that's why we have decided to use colloidal metal particles, preformed colloidal metal particles to decouple the deposition step and the metal particle creation step. Now we have used here the reducing agent method where we have a protective ligand. So we take the gold cursor, the protective agent, which could be glucose or polyvinyl alcohol, polyvinyl pyrolidon. Mix it with the reducing agent, you form small particles, gold clusters, they're protected. And then you add them to the support and since you now have decoupled the synthesis of the gold particles from the deposition, if you use different supports, all the gold particles on these different supports are identical. And I will later show that we can, we can prove this. We have made two different, uh, or used two different protecting agents. In this case, it's even the reductant itself. So we have done it with glucose and with polyvinyl alcohol. We found that with polyvinyl alcohol, the gold particles get smaller on average. See, this is a 20 nanometer scale, while this is 50 nanometers, about the same scale. But here, the particles are way smaller. So all the other experiments were then done with the PVA stabilized gold particles, which had a size of about 3 to 4 nanometers. Now we have deposited these particles by a solution process on three, four different supports material. <coughs> two supposedly inert ones, alumina and zirconia, two supposedly more redox, redox active ones, titania and zinc oxide. So alumina, zirconia, titania, zinc oxide. We have done rather careful analysis of the particle size distributions on these different supports by electron microscopy really counted particles and what you basically see is that the particle size distribution for the four different supports are 
essentially identical, which means that the, the step decoupling the gold particle synthesis and the deposition step is a success. Now, if we now look at the catalytic performance, and we first look at the two supposedly inert supports, what we see is that alumina has an ignition temperature. This is a conversion, CO conversion curve. T50, where we have 50% conversion, is at minus 10 centigrades. For the zirconia, we are talking about 100 centigrades. Two supposedly inert supports which were according to the ideas expected to be similar. This is the curve for the first one where we basically have to burn up, burn up the ligand sphere from the uh, supports. That's why the activity is much worse in the first one. So we can do the first one and then we get stable activity. Now let's have a look at the supposedly redox active supports. Titania, minus 10 centigrades. Zinc oxide has a very strange behavior, but if we, if we do isothermal measurements, don't want to go into detail here, these are the comparable measurements, then it's plus 50. So it's clear the gold does have a, the, the support does have an effect, but it's certainly not correlated to the redox activity of the support. It must be correlated to something else. At present, we are not totally sure to what it is correlated, but we have an idea, because if you look carefully, not just pound sizes of the particles. If you really go into a higher resolution, what you find is that these particles are not round anymore like they are in solution when we have synthesized them, the gold particles. They are faceted. They are deposited on the support. This is on zirconia. Here we are talking about titania. You see on the zinc oxide, the faceting looks somewhat different. And our current hypothesis is that the support induces a certain type of faceting, and then we have a different degree of corner edge atoms present on the gold particles, and the corner and edge atoms may in fact be the really active sites in this reaction. And so we are now looking more deeply into it. There are actually theoretical calculations which support this idea so that it's, it's the edge and corner atoms which are the really active ones, if we can change their concentration and we will have different activity catalysts, even if we have the same metal particle size. So this summarizes this part. Uh, the support has an influence on the performance beyond allowing the formation of small particle size, because with the same particle size, with the same synthesis route for the colloids, four different supports and four different activities, and widely different. From minus 10 to plus 100. This is orders of magnitude in reaction rate. Uh, and it's certainly not that the support effect can be categorized in redox active and redox inactive uh, supports. There must be something else. Coming to the third point. Now we use colloidal metal particles to create additional functionality in catalytic materials. And what we set out to do was to produce magnetically separable catalysts. They are interesting for reactions going on in the liquid phase, because there, typically, you want fine particles to minimize mass transfer uh, resistance. But if you use fine particles, they are very difficult to separate from the, from the solution. So you typically have to use cross flow, filtration, or other possibilities, uh, which is actually not really ideal. The catalyst should be super paramagnetic, which means they should be so that the magnetic particles should be so small that they retain their magnetism only with an applied magnetic field. If you switch off the field, you should lose the magnetism because otherwise, you do the reaction one, then the particles get all magnetized at room temperature, and then everything clusters together, and you can never get it redispersed. So you need a system where particles are super paramagnetic. So switching off magnetic field switches off the magnetism of the particles. And then we want other properties of our catalyst to be unaffected. Porosity, the pore system should still be acceptable. In order to achieve this goal, we use the method of nanocasting, which has developed by has been developed by Ryu Ryu for the creation of porous carbon of the CMK3, CMK5 type. And what Ryu developed was the following. He started 
with the mesoporous ordered silica SBA15. And he filled the pores of this material with a carbon precursor. In the easiest case, you take sucrose and then carbonize it to so burn a caramel, basically. And you have the pores filled with carbon. Then you carbonize to so high temperature in a gas treatment. So you have carbon in the silica. Then you leach out the silica and you have a carbon negative material of your initial carbon negative replica of your initial silica. This is how such a system would look like. The sorption isotherms indicate a nice pore system. This is actually a tube type carbon where we don't fill the, cut, fill the template pores completely just coat the walls, so we then have a bundle, basically hexagonally ordered bundle of carbon nanotypes with very high surface areas. Look at this volume absorbed here. If you look into the TEM, you see here the carbon pipes. There is a hole in the center of the carbon pipes, and there is a hole around the carbon pipes. So this is really a highly porous material, which basically has uh, 2,500 square meters per gram, if you, if you synthesize it correctly. And from this experience, Andrew Lu and my group came up with the idea of a rather complex appearing procedure, but which is actually not so difficult to prepare magnetic carbons. He said, why don't we take the initial ordered mesoporous silica, we fill the pores with carbon, but then we leave the carbon in the pores, because now we want to introduce the magnetism. And then we use cobalt nanoparticles, and these were actually prepared from the carbon by carbonyl decomposition. So we deposit cobalt nanoparticles, and since the pores of the silica are filled, these cobalt nanoparticles can only sit on the external surface of our particles, so not obstructing any porosity in the materials. The problem with cobalt nanoparticles is they are extremely air sensitive. They burn, essentially. If you expose them to air, they burn, and the magnetism is gone. And that's not what you want. So we said, well, we carbonize again. Let's put purpuric alcohol on there, just one molecular layer, essentially, carbonize, and then we have covered the cobalt particles, each with a very thin carbon layer, and they cannot be oxidized anymore. Then we leach out the silica, and we have a porous carbon, which is magnetic because it has cobalt firmly attached to it. And then we can introduce any catalytic material we want to create magnetically separable hydrogenation. This is how the material looks like after the cobalt impregnation and the silica leaching step. You see everywhere on the external surface of these particles there are these black dots and these are actually 9 nanometer sized cobalt particles which is just the size range for super paramagnetism. This is what we want. These are stable against leaching because they survive the leaching of the silica either by sodium hydroxide or by hydrofluoric acid. So these are really protected with the exception of some of them. If you look carefully, and I'm not sure whether people in the back rows will, will recognize this, here is actually a very thin structure which has the same size as the dark structures, the cobalt particles, which is hollow. This is an imperfect, or this was imperfectly protected cobalt particles where the cobalt has been leached out of this hollow carbon sphere and we just remain, we just remain with, the, with, with the hollow carbon sphere left and the cobalt has been leached. But we lose only about 15% of the cobalt. The rest stays in there, gives the material many properties. This can best be seen just in such a visual experiment. We take a solution with rhodamine 6G just a dye solution, aqueous dye solution. We drop in the carbon, shake it a little bit. It takes about 10 seconds, then the solution is colorless. If we place a magnet next to it, the carbon sticks to the wall. We can pipe it off the clean solution and reuse the carbon as an absorber. Now we want to produce a catalyst, so we, we introduce palladium into the pores, this material. And then in a very simple hydrogenation, we didn't want to get fancy with the hydrogenation, we wanted to prove that it's, it's doable to fully separate. This is the, the, the blue one here, or the turquoise one, is the first catalytic run. This is final completion, everything has been reacted uh, here in this case. Then we magnetically separate, fill in new octene, hydrogenate again, get the very same activity. 
but that doesn't mean that we have completely removed the catalyst magnetically. What we did then is we let it react half, then filtered uh, and added the team and looked at further consumption and we see that we worked in the magnetically separated supernatant, no hydrogenation activity whatsoever. So the, the magnetic separation is really complete in this system. We can create a magnetically separable catalyst which is super power magnetic so it doesn't cluster together after you have magnetized it and used it. It can be used in several times. We can do the very same thing for silica. I don't want to go into details. Uh, you, you protect the pores of the silica by a polymer which you can later on decompose, deposit cobalt on the outside protect the cobalt, decompose the poly polymer again to, to make the pore system accessible, and then you have a magnetic silica. It's in principle the very same process. What I like here is that this is something like protection group strategy in organic chemistry, just for porous materials. We protect the inside of the pore <laughs> system by a reversible blocking agent. This is in this case, uh, this uh, polymethyl metacrylate, which it can decompose tracelessly at 500 centigrade. So you fill all the pores with PMMA, and you can do something to the outside without affecting the inner pore surface, and then later on you just heat, and the PMMA is gone. So you have the pore system for further use. Coming to the last point, we can also use pore, uh, uh, colloidal metal particles for a rather involved synthesis procedure by which we can make synthesis-stable catalysts. This is something Pablo Arnaldo Massimo Comati came up with. So the idea is the following. We start with a gold cluster. Gold is the easiest one because this, that, that's the reason why we started with it. All the other metals are more difficult. I'll show you later. So we start with a gold cluster. There are techniques that you can prepare a silica shell, a dense shell, silica shell, on the gold cluster. We had previously developed a method to coat the silica shell with a thin porous zirconia shell. And then the idea was if you then leach the silica, <coughs> you are left with the zirconia, and the gold particle should be encaged in the zirconia shell. And since this synthesis strategy gives you exactly one metal particle in each hollow shell, the system cannot sinter anymore because there is no possibility that two metal particles ever They're like a line behind bars, they're completely encaged. Can you see that the strategy that works? This is the CM of this stage, so um, we actually did a statistics. 95% of the silica spheres contain exactly one gold particle. Some are empty, some contain two, but 95% contain one gold particle. <coughs> then we grow the zirconia sphere around, which you can maybe guess. There, there is a little bit rough surface here. This is a thin 30 to 40 nanometer thick zirconia shell. And then just with uh, <coughs> sodium hydroxide, we leach the silica. And what you notice is here the gold particles are in the center because they are suspended by the, by the silica shell uh, sphere. Here, the gold particles are basically just somewhere in the hollow shell because they just fall somewhere where they want to want to want to sit. They are in fact interstable. This is zero oxidation on these materials. The gold particles are rather big, so the conversion here <coughs> reaches 50% only at 200 centigrade. The yellow curve is the first run. The purple curve is the run after these catalysts have been calcined at 800 centigrade. And all of you who have worked with gold catalysts before know that at 800 centigrade, the gold centers tremendously. If you run this catalyst a second time, it has essentially the same conversion curve. And if you do a benchmark catalyst, you destroy the spheres, the zirconia spheres of this very same catalyst, and run, you see that the activity is appreciably lower because the gold starts to center. Now you can play around with the system. The spheres I have shown you so far have a relatively low gold concentration because the shells were pretty big and the gold particles were in, in the inside of a big hollow shell. 
Now, if we play around with the size of the silica template spheres, we can control the size of the shell. Here you see if we use 50 nanometer silica spheres, or we make essentially 50 to 70 nanometer thick hollow shells. <coughs> Since the gold particles remain at the same size, they now have a much higher fraction of the material. This is 100 nanometer, this is 150 nanometer. The shell size thickness can be kept more or less constant if we vary shell size, and, but we can also control the shell size by, let's say, a factor of three by coating it. So that system has a lot of flexibility. Then we attempted to change the shell material. This is now titania. These shells are of titania. You see they look a little bit different. The pores are somewhat bigger, but you can essentially do a similar process if you want gold particles in a titanium shell. Process is identical, gold particle into a silica sphere, coat the silica sphere with titania, leach out the silica, and you have gold in a hollow titania sphere, which again is synthesis stable, but the titania synthesis earlier, so you cannot go to such high temperatures as for the zirconium. The one which we really wanted was not gold, we wanted a more attractive uh, catalytic material like platinum, which is used in three-way catalysts, for instance, which you could stabilize by this method. These are the first uh, results. They are not optimized yet, but I thought I would also show you data more or less from the bench. Platinum in zirconia uh, shells. Sometimes we succeed in having one platinum in a zirconia shell, <coughs> but sometimes there are also two in there or none in there. So this system is not as easily controlled as the gold system, uh, and the platinum particles have a substructure. So if you look at them at relatively low resolution, you see they are approximately <coughs> something like 20 nanometers in diameter, but if you go high resolution, you see that these are aggregates of very, very tiny platinum particles, which are uh, about one nanometer each. So these will center to a bigger particle if you need up but there is no more than these platinum particles in one of these shells, so the final particles can never get bigger than the addition of all these tiny little ones. I would say with the, with the platinum system, we are almost there, and we, we actually want smaller platinum. And this, this is again platinum in, in zirconia, one of the most recent batches. It's more difficult to analyze because the contrast between zirconia and, uh, and the platinum is not as high, but you can See here a platinum particle, here is one, here is one, here is one. So that seems to work reasonably well with the system. And these catalysts we have tested in denox uh, under highly oxidizing conditions. Uh, they are not as good as a commercial platinum containing catalyst yet, but they are more center stable. And we are pretty sure that we can move the system to a state where it is really very, very useful, and this method is very useful. With this, I want to summarize. Uh, I hope that I have, with this survey, shown you that colloidal metal particles can be used in many, many places in catalysis. And as I said, the toolbox of the people who develop syntheses for colloidal metal particles has extremely expanded over the last 20 years. There are so many possibilities to make all the different kinds of metal particles that this toolbox is basically unlimited. In the first part, I have shown you the copper catalyst can make very high activity catalysts without needing something which stabilizes the high surface area. You can use them for fundamental studies <coughs> if, you, if you want to study support effects and decouple metal particle formation from the catalyst creation. I have shown you that you can create composites with novel properties. Here is magnetically separable catalyst I have described to you. And finally, uh, we can make novel composites which have additional properties like this high thermal stability because we have in fact completely isolated metal particles so that they cannot grow into each other. There was a whole lot of people involved in this. This is a picture of the whole group. These are senior scientists from the institute who have at different points contributed. And Huilu actually shows up twice because he started out as a postdoc and was then promoted to uh, associate professor in the group. 
So when we knew that the magnetic particles, Michel Paul, Pablo Anon, Massimo Camatti, did these hollow sphere encapsulation, uh, Jean-Sébastien Girardon, Christina, uh, Sasha Vukoyevich did the methanol synthesis, uh, Massimo Komati also did the deposition together with Wen Sui Li of the gold particles, and Axel Dreyer, Ben Peter were responsible for TM analysis, which we excessively need. And Jan de Grunwald helped us out with some uh, um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and the funding came primarily from the Max Planck Society, but also from a number of other sources. With this, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you again the organizers, mm -hmm. and I want to thank my <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schultz, for your extremely interesting presentation, and I have something for you.